Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. September 18th, National Back to Church Sunday. Get here. If you've been watching online for three years, get here. Come on back to church. Three years is long enough. Come see you. See me face to face and see what's up. Hey, last week we handed out these forms. We got some at the Welcome Center still. It's our fall semester. Everything that's coming up, who's preaching, what's being taught uh, from now until the end of the year. And I want to tell you a, a praise report. Pastor John Mark took this uh, to a local business and told them about what we're doing with our college and that we're scholarshipping anybody who wants a Christian education uh, for their bachelor's degree or their master's degree. And the guy, uh, he, he said that his business needs to write off a certain amount of money every year to offset their taxes. And the guy from his business gave $10,000 to our college. So I'm just going to say this, to be a kingdom giver, maybe it doesn't look right in your wallet, but you could take something like this and be a fundraiser for the kingdom of God, and as long as God can get it through you, he'll get it to you. All right, don't get me preaching. Don't get me preaching. All right, let me ask this question as we start today. How many theologians do I have in the room today? How many theologians? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine out of however many we have in the room today are theologians. Okay, let me, let me define what theology is. The word theology is a compound word. It's the word theos and ology. Theos is the Greek word for God. And ology is the word logos, meaning the word, God's word or the word of God. Okay, uh, it can also be translated theology can be God speaking. Okay, so let me ask this again. The most literal meaning of the word is studying of God's word. So let me boil it way down. How many people in here have ever read the Bible? Not the whole thing, but just a part of it. Okay, now look around the room. Look how many theologians we have in the room. Look at all these theologians. Now, when I learned that, my first year of my master's classes, it was like inspiring to me that I did not have to have a PhD or 10 years of study to be a theologian. That anybody who studies the Bible, anybody who reads the divine word of God is a theologian. You are a theologian, right? Now, there's some things that come with being a theologian, and we're going to study that out today. This series that we're going into, as you can see on the curriculum here, is laid out a lot like a college semester. We are going to go back to the basics and study the basics of Christian doctrine and the beliefs of family church. We're going to do it in a very scholastic way. It's going to look a little bit different than our last series. Our last series was stories of Jesus. So I would take a big, long passage of scripture, read it to you, and then go back and break it down. This study is going to look different. We are going to start with a topic, and then I'm going to have supporting scripture to support my thesis of that statement or what we're studying today. Today's topic is the Bible. The Bible. Here at Family Church, we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Say that with me. The Bible is the inspired word of God. The Bible is the inspired word of God. Now, we got to break that down. What does this mean that the Bible is the inspired word of God? Firstly, we believe 
that without the Bible, we have no guide or direction to live out our belief system. Without the Bible, we do not have a guide or a direction to live out our belief system called Christianity. We need it. It is our roadmap for life. But I will challenge anybody who believes differently. I believe that you can find God without the Bible. I believe you can find God without the Bible. But you cannot grow and understand your beliefs without it. I believe that you can find God in nature. I like to go out to Colorado to, to go hunting in the mountains. And I'll tell you, as the sun is rising in the Colorado mountains with this beautiful red and purple and orange colors, man, it's like godly. It's godly. I heard one theologian talk about God and creation like this. He equated it to God being a watchmaker and the world and us being a watch. If a person was walking down the street and they found a watch, they didn't know what it was, a wristwatch, and they wound it and they saw its mechanisms and how they moved and how the hands sweep, swept across the face and how all the timing was intricate, they would look at that watch and they would know that this watch did not make itself. This watch did not accidentally come into being, but that there was detailed design and knowledge and understanding to create that watch. We understand that God is the watchmaker, and the earth and the world and who we are is the watch. That we did not accidentally happen, but there was exact detail and design behind our reproductive system, our respiratory system, our excretory system, our skeletal system, all 12 systems that make the human body, God intricately designed. You see, we could look at the human body and it would lead us to a maker. It would lead us to God. Because of that, we must believe that if he gave us scripture, if he gave us guidance, that the word is an inspired word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 needs to be one of those verses. If we're doing Bible school, 2 Timothy 3.16 needs to be one of those ones that you memorize, that you know as a Christian. Every Christian should have 2 Timothy 3.16 in their back pocket as a doctrinal belief. And it says this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. This is what the word of God is for. It is the inspired word and it has taught us and serves us in four ways. Number one, it teaches us doctrine. It brings reproof. And now reproof is one of those ones that's a little confusing. Because why would he reproof us and correct us? Reproof is one of those things that it shows us the things that displease God. Not everything that displeases God is necessarily a sin. Although sin absolutely displeases God, there are things that displease God that are not inherently sin. Okay, let's talk about this for a second. And uh, this may be a very bad illustration, but it's one that I have. You're driving on a road trip with your kids in the back seat, having a great time. Your kids start laughing in the back seat. But their laughing turns into screechingly annoying sounds that just are completely inappropriate for the decibel levels of your ears in the car and although the cheers and laughs that were once silly and funny are now angering you in the front seat and you stop it yes, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> and then you tell your kids car voices inside voices it's too loud now your kids didn't sin they didn't do anything wrong they're being kids they're laughing, 
but it displeased you that it hurt your ears and it annoyed you because you're grumpy, because you didn't have enough coffee, right? And then we put it on our kids like it was, God doesn't do that, but we put it on our kids that they were being too loud and whatever. There's things that displease God that are not necessarily sin, and the scripture will show us that. The scripture will show us those things that are not his perfect design for us. But then it will also bring correction. It will bring correction. And let me tell you, the, the way that God corrects, I'm telling you, is not the way that you speak to yourself. It's not the way that you discipline yourself. It's not that, you stupid idiot. God doesn't talk to you like that. The word correction is actually a gentle correction. It's a gentle correction. If you've ever taught somebody how to drive, and you're on the passenger side, and maybe they don't have full control of the car, you, you might lift your hand up and correct the steering wheel to bring the car back into the lane. That's kind of what it is. That's that gentle correction that he's supposed to bring. And then the last one, it says that he delivers instruction. Instruction in righteousness. And this is what I love about God. God never brings correction without instruction. Now, we do. We do. We tell kids, stop doing that. And they say, why? Because I said so. <laughs> Question me. Why don't you just do what I say? Just do what I say when I say it. Right? Just do what I say when I say it. I don't have to explain myself. Oh, how that worked for you when you were a child. <laughs> right? God will always tell you why. God will always tell you why when he brings correction. Now, whether your ear is inclined to hear it or not is a different story. Whether you take time and search scripture to find his why. That's a different story. But anytime God brings correction, that's why it's in this order, anytime he brings correction, he brings instruction. So what do we mean by an inspired word of God? We believe that the writers of the Bible were inspired by the Holy Spirit, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, to write what they wrote. The Holy Spirit, the word spirit, there is the word pneuma, pneuma, P N. E-U-M-A, pneuma. And it literally means breathed. God breathed his word and they wrote it. You cannot speak words out of your mouth without breathing. As you speak, you are exhaling. You're exhaling. And it's a breath. Your words are a breath. And that's what the spirit was. When God spoke these words to men... They were inspired by his word that they received, and they wrote scripture. But this brings us to a couple questions, and I'm going to ask the questions that a, theo a theologian would ask. And the first one is this, so why do we need an inspired word? Why does it have to be inspired? Why couldn't it just be idealistic? Why does it have to be inspired? And Isaiah 55, 9 kind of displays that for us properly. He says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. We will never fully understand God. So we need a mediator. We need someone to dumb it down for us. Huh? Yes? So National Back to Church Sunday is on the 18th, and I'm going to be preaching the topic of the Trinity. The Trinity, the Godhead, Elohim. It's a big topic. It's a controversial topic. It's split denominations. And I'm going to do my best to explain what the Trinity is, how we can have God three in one, and, and I'm going to do my best. But ultimately and honestly, no human being can fully grasp the concept of God. We just cannot and I will make it so plain, and yet there are going to be aspects of the Trinity that I will never and you will never understand until we get to heaven and see it with our eyes. Wow. Wow. So we need an inspired word. We need God to speak to anointed men to say, here is how God wants to say it today. And that's proper theology. Proper theology says... What is God saying 
to us today. But this gives us this question, how can we believe the Bible? How can you believe all that stuff, Pastor Mike? How can you believe, and this would be a real big one, right? How can you believe that all these animals just magically walked on the ark? Honestly, I choose to. I choose to believe the Word of God. I choose to believe that the Word of God is inspired by God, that it is His Word. Secondly, beyond me choosing to, there's something called the miracle of scriptural unity. The miracle of scriptural unity. There is no other document in the history of the world that shows such unity as the Bible. You can search it out. That's why it's one of the longest printed books in history, is the Bible. It has a miracle of scriptural unity. Here's some facts that you would learn in Bible school. And again, this whole series is going to be like this. It's going to be like school. But here's some facts. The Bible was written over a period of 1,600 years. From beginning to end, it was written, authored over a period of 1,600 years by more than 40 authors. 40 different people over 1,600 years. And there's not a single contradiction. Now, you, maybe you've heard it said, between the four Gospels, there's contradictions. No, there's not. No, there's not. If four different people all attended the same play, one had a front row seat, one had a back row seat, one had a backstage seat, and one was in the balcony, all watching the same play are going to have different point of views. They're going to have different perspectives of the same story. If we study out theology, it is believed that Mark, the Mark Hand Gospel, was written first, and that the others built their stories and their, their um, Gospels off of the Mark Hand Gospel, off of Mark. And so, just like you and I, just, just like your spouse and you, when she or he starts telling the story, you're like, hey, you forgot this. Oh, no, that's not important. Leave that out. Oh, just skip to the good part. Just like that, the other Gospels, built off of their perspective, said, wait, it's important for me to add this to Mark's story. It's important for me to tell this perspective. But perfect unity. They all tell the same story. The claims of Scripture must become a personal conviction of ours through the work of the Holy Spirit. We must believe that the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. Amen. If it gets beyond that, you don't have sound theology. We have to understand this. The Holy Spirit doesn't change His words of the Scriptures in any way. Although Scripture is fully relevant and applicable today, it's the same scripture. It never changed. And how can that be? Hebrews 4.12 tells us this. The word of God is quick. And another translation says the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit. That's important. That's important. Because when you study this out and you look at the Greek word, for spirit, it's the exact same Greek word for soul. Like in the Greek, soul and spirit are the same word. The same word. The only thing that can discern between whether it was your idea or a God-spoken word, the only thing that can say, yes, this was your, your mind or this was your spirit, is the word of God. It's the only thing. So if you ever question, man, was that God? Go to his word. And if it's not in his word, it might just be your head. It might just be your mind and your soul. Your mind is so powerful. It is so creative, but it's not God. And it says, and of the joint and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God will tell you if your intentions are correct. 
if your heart is right. So I want to get to this part here today. The Bible is alive and it speaks to us today and we got to ask this question. Theology asks questions. If you're going to write, if you were going to write a research paper, a theological paper, you're going to start with a problem. You're going to ask a question and then you're going to look to solve that problem. And so this whole series, we're just going to keep asking questions. But how does the Bible speak if not everyone can easily understand it? And I'm going to give you a little tip. When I used to read the King James Bible, I needed all of this revelation from God because I didn't understand it. And I'd be like, oh my God, I see it. The scripture's telling me this. And then I got the New Living Translation Bible, and I didn't need so much revelation. <laughs> because it was written in a way that I understood the words. It took out the these and the thous and the thus and the uh. And it spoke to me in natural words that I understood. We need to get a translation that we can understand. A translation that speaks our language and speaks today. And Paul hints to this. He says, how can someone get saved if they don't hear the gospel? How can someone receive the gospel if no one preaches it to them in Romans 10, 14? Because we know that Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He says, if there's no preaching of the word of Christ, people won't be saved. Because salvation comes through the knowledge of the word. So in order to know how to become a Christian, one must either read about it or have someone explain it to them. And if you look at your own journey of how you found Christ, you either came to a church and you heard somebody preach and it convicted your heart and you made a decision. Or you were watching TV, uh, somebody on TV, and you saw something, and it spoke to you, and you believed. Or you were sitting there reading the Bible, and it showed you that it was true, and you put your faith. Either way, it came by the hearing of the word. By the hearing of the word. And Paul told Timothy that, these, that the word of God were sacred writings, and they were able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So Family Church believes that the Bible is the inspired word of God, but then Family Church goes one step further. We believe that the Bible is infallible, inerrant, that the Bible is inerrant. This simply means that the Bible is without error. The Bible is without error. And that's a very bold claim. That's a bold statement. Here's what I'm not saying. I am not saying that there's not a single typo in a modern Bible. I'm not saying that. There could be a typo. There could be the way that it printed on the page, it could be smudged. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that from the King James translation to the New Living Translation to the NIV translation that, that things weren't changed. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about God speaking to man in the original manuscripts is without error. And we go even further. We go even further. We believe that scripture aligns with science and history as well. Now that's a bold claim. And last service, I've lost some people. I lost some people last service. And I'm just going to give a little bit of a claim here, all right? I'm not a scientist, but there's a flaw in our science. There's our flaw in our dating of items. We're going to say that the things that we've dated are billions of years old. By what metric are you dating that? By a metric you created. So there's already a flaw. We created dating, carbon dating, based upon our own metrics of our own design that could be fouled and flawed. We could not, could not possibly know. We're, it's, it's our best guess, and that's not science. We believe that the Bible and science align. The Bible does only account for 6,000 years in Scripture. But I believe 
in between and throughout Scripture, it points to years and years and years that we don't fully have record of. I believe it perfectly aligns. Now, you may go through Scripture and begin to say, well, this doesn't align, this doesn't align. Listen, here's what I believe. I, in, in the best words that I could possibly say, I found Augustine had wrote in the 5th century. Augustine wrote this. I most firmly believe that the authors of Scripture were completely free from error. And if in these writings I am perplexed by anything which appears to be to me opposed to truth, I do not hesitate to suppose that either the manuscript is faulty or the translator has not caught the meaning of what was said or I myself have failed to understand it. We must believe that if there's ever something that we are perplexed about that the fault is on our side and not that of Scripture. Now, we don't want to admit that because we're so smart. We know everything. We just figured it out. But that's why the Bible says, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Jesus is the Word made flesh, sent to dwell among us. He spoke the Father's words to the writers of the Bible without an error in his speech. And in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, in the very last chapter, in the last three sentences, we're given a statement that's a very, very strong statement. It demands respect for the Scripture. And in Revelation 22, verse 18, it says this, For I testify to everyone who hears the word of prophecy in this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life from the holy city and from the things that were written in this book. So do not add to and do not take away. That's a scary, scary, scary thing. In a society today that we want to be uh, buffet Christians. You know what buffet Christian is? They go up and pick and choose what they want. You go up to the buffet, you don't ever get the broccoli. You don't ever get the cream spinach. You're eating all this meat, and you go up to the buffet, right? It's a pick and choose kind of thing. And we don't get to pick and choose the Bible. We don't get to pick and choose what we want to believe in the Bible. It's the inspired, infallible, incorruptible, inerrant word of God. But those guys are so old. It was so long ago. Could the scripture possibly apply Today, do we still, I mean, listen, in light of society, in light of everything that we're allowed to do today, does the Bible still apply today? And I, I love that question. I love that question. But we must refer back to Hebrews 4.12, where it said, the word of God is alive. It's alive. It's a living, breathing thing. And this is what I love about the word of God that he wrote in the Bible, being alive. That he wrote one other thing before the Bible. It was called the law. And the law was written on stone. Stone is hard, it's cold, and you can have no relationship with it. It's not alive. Stone is dead. But he sent his word in the human form as Jesus Christ as a living, breathing being, that we could have a relationship with the Word. The Word is alive. The Word is powerful. We can have a relationship with this. Does it apply today? Absolutely. Because although the Scripture has never changed, the revelation of Scripture grows, matures, applies, and is always relevant. But I'll be honest with you, most pastors don't stay relevant. The Word of God is always relevant, but not all pastors stay relevant. 
We've had people visit our church and they say, I don't understand why I got to have all those disco lights. Like it's a disco club. At first I'm like, what's a disco? <laughs> what are we talking about here? What are we talking about? <laughs> disco club. I don't understand why I got to have haze and smoke and these crazy. Because we're celebrating Jesus Christ. Yeah. It is a party. It is a party knowing that you went from death to life. That you were lost in sin with no hope. And Jesus Christ walked in. I can celebrate that. If that means that it looks like a disco club, then hey, guess what? Disco Jesus. Let's do this. Let's do this. But when a church and a pastor want to stay stuck at their original revelation of God, and they don't renew a new revelation of God, the church will die. The church will stay old and stagnant. I'm sorry that we don't have tapestries and fake flowers on the stage, but we did that in the 80s. We did that in the 80s. Could you imagine if contemporary church never went contemporary? We still wouldn't have bands. I mean, oh my God, do you know when the guitar came into church? Everyone was going to hell. Sad. Got guitar, got live music. There's no place for live music. Where's the hymnals? Just think about it. How ridiculous. It's the same message, but the method by which we deliver that message must be relevant for generations. The word that spoke to you is going to sound differently than the word that's going to speak to your children. It's the same word, but it's going to speak differently. And if, you know, here's, I'm going to talk to some people online. Here's the problem that we have with church that is growing and emerging is that most of us want church to stay at the place it was when we joined it. There was something about the way that church was done then that you liked, that brought you to Christ. Therefore, it's the flavor that you want. But you must also understand that there are new people coming to the knowledge of Christ and that it must be relevant and alive today. If we want to get stuck back in the 80s, listen, God says, you have to forget the former. For I want to do a new thing. Could you imagine God wanting to do a new thing, but we keep him stuck in old ways? Come on, somebody. <laughs> Ministers can get outdated. Sermons can be preached not living. But the word of God is always alive. The scripture never changes. It's the same word. But our understanding, our interpretation needs to be relevant for generation to generation to generation. We must speak the sound of our generation. And this is just good theology. Remember I asked you for a theologian? Well, it demands, theology demands that we ask this question. In light of the scripture, in light of the scripture, reading what the scripture says, what is God saying to me today? That's the question of theology. In light of scripture, what is God saying to me today? It cannot be based on 1980 theology. It cannot be based on the word that God said 40 years ago. It is living bread. It is daily bread. It is a breath from heaven speaking to you. And that's, that's the part of scripture that we can never understand. Is that you could read the same verse 10 different times and it say 10 different things. Although it has one truth. It can say 10 things. Let me give you an example. Ready? John 3.16. How many know John 3.16? Most quoted verse in the whole Bible. All right, ready? Now, let me tell you how to be a theologian. 
for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world he gave his only son. Now, every single time I quoted that verse, it was a completely different sermon. That was a completely different sermon. One scripture emphasizing something differently speaks a volume to you, a whole sermon to you. That's a living word. That's an inspired word. What is God speaking to you today? Maybe you sit back saying, it ain't speaking nothing because I've read my Bible and never heard anything. Ah. You see, the Bible tells us that with his children, with those who fear him, for those who revere him, with them, he shares the secrets of his covenant. That the job of the Holy Spirit that comes and lives and abides on the inside of us, his job is to be a revealer of the word. Is that he would open the eyes of your understanding. He would enlighten you to his truth. He would show you things. And if your eyes are dimmed, if your eyes are closed, the Bible says that the hearts and the minds of the unbeliever are blinded to the truth of Scripture. Ah, so we need to step into a relationship with him. And when we step into a relationship with him, the blinders open. He begins to speak truth. He begins to speak his word into your life in a way that is understandable, that's life-giving. That it's applicable to your life. And maybe you're here today or you're watching online and you've never been able to or have never had the opportunity to do what Romans 10, 9 says. And that is to believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead. And if you do that, the Bible says that you shall be saved. That's how we step into this relationship with him. We step into a covenant with him. If you're here today or you're watching online, and you've never had an opportunity to receive the word in its fullness, in its truth. The word made flesh, that is Jesus Christ. We'd love to offer that opportunity to you right now by praying this prayer. If you would repeat with me. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.